The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Wednesday will be the first uh, celebration of learning. Test one, Wednesday, October 7th, you will write during the normal class time. So you'll have 50 minutes, and we want to have a little bit of um, uh, comfort here, so you won't be sitting cheek to jowl. So uh, before long, I'll have the room assignment. So uh, some of you will write in here. We'll have few, uh, fewer people than seats, so that there'll be vacancies next to each person. And then some will write uh, a few of the other locations, probably 26, 100, and, uh, and the, uh, the gym above the Walker Memorial. Um, and we'll get that out to you. And uh, next week on the 6th, we will have no weekly quiz because, you know, enough celebrating is uh, no point in testing you on the 6th and on the 7th. There will be, of course, uh, the, the mini celebration tomorrow, uh, quiz three. Uh, and I'll be available for office hours later today. Um, so, uh, oh, and the coverage, uh, just to remove the mystery, the coverage will be right up to um, the 7th of October. Uh, I've been t doing this for over 30 years, and it's, uh, I've learned that in order to inspire interest on the part of the student, it really pays to have the coverage of the celebration extend up to the lecture before the celebration. Now, obviously, I'm not going to drill deep on something I taught you on October 5th, but um, it would be a good idea to stay awake during all of the lectures between now and then. Um, so last day we talked about ionic bonding, and uh, ionic bonding occurs uh, with electrostatic attraction between ions that have formed through electron transfer, and uh, we saw the, the energy of the ion pair given by this formula where we have Coulomb's law uh, with the uh, Born exponent, and then this is plotted. This is E at R equals R naught, and we uh, learned that there were two terms, uh, the attractive term, which is the Coulombic force here shown, um, and then there's a repulsive term, which results from electron-electron uh, interaction when the two ions get very, very close together. And this is taken from your text, and I think it did a very nice job here of illustrating as you go to high values of R, they're depicting that you have the ions separated by a considerable distance, and there's a certain amount of stored energy, but not a lot. And then if you go uh, much, much closer than the hard sphere sum of uh, the ionic radii, I think they're depicting here that there's some squashing of the electron clouds, and you can see that the energy has gone way, way up. So this is an unfavorable uh, situation, meaning that the energy here is greater than zero. And there's a sweet spot here at 236 uh, picometers, which represents the ideal location. And that is the sum of the radius of the sodium ion and the radius of the chloride ion. And so you can see how energy tracks. And if you go far, far, far away, to the point where they're at infinite separation, there's no energy stored. So everything, everything makes sense. And then we said, well, what happens if we keep packing these things uh, we, we rationalized that they would continue to do so and ultimately form a three-dimensional crystal. And so you can see there's a lot of similarity between what's above and what's down here. This has been written for a 1-1 one, one system. In other words, a cation plus 1 and an anion uh, minus 1, but it, it could be mediated by the, by the valences. And what we have here is the um, structure factor. This Madelung constant tells us how much we get uh, decrease in the energy of the system by going to a three-dimensional array. So depending on the atomic arrangement, we'll have a different value of Madelung constant. We saw that for sodium chloride, the value is 1.7476, and different crystals have different things. And what determines the crystal structure? It's a combination of the size of the two ions and their valence. So the, what we saw for sodium chloride this is a structured type. So obviously sodium chloride is um, sodium chloride crystal structure. But there is a, a, an entire uh, suite of compounds that have radius ratios and charges that end up with a sodium chloride type crystal structure. And then towards the end, we started looking at the 
Born-Haber cycle, and the purpose of the Born-Haber cycle was to give us a sense of scale of the various cons constituents in the formation of a crystal, and what we noted, the takeaway message from the Born-Haber cycle is that this enthalpy of crystallization, which is basically this term here, the enthalpy of crystallization is huge. It's huge. It was the big component of the energy required to form the crystal. It's large and it is negative. So what I want to do today is uh, start by uh, talking about uh, shortcomings of the business of ionic bonding. See, how do we get to ionic bonding? We started with this idea of octet stability. Octet stability was the driving idea behind all of this. Octet stability, and in the case of uh, uh, ionic uh, bonding, this was via electron transfer. And so that got us a long way. But it has its limitations. So let's put up some new data. So suppose I look at compounds like H2, N2, O2. Uh, do these things form ionic bonds? Uh, how does octet stability play here? And um, so let's, let's start by looking at hydrogen. So if we took hydrogen and started with atomic hydrogen and added an electron to it, then we would form an entity known as H minus. And H minus looks pretty good because it's isoelectronic with helium. So maybe this isn't going to be so bad a day. Uh, but if we're going to have a bond, then we need to form an H plus. So let's do that. So that would be then H goes to H plus plus an electron. And that's really nothing more than a proton. And so that doesn't look too appealing. That's probably a high energy state. And besides, in the same location at the same time, in other words, same temperature, same conditions, half of the hydrogens have to acquire electrons, and half of the hydrogens have to lose electrons. And that's not going to happen. They're either going to have a propensity for electron gain or a propensity for electron loss. So it looks like ionic bonding, ionic bonding is not going to help us explain the formation of molecules such as H2, N2, and so on. So who came to the rescue in this case to get us out of the conundrum? G.N. Lewis. G.N. Lewis. G.N. Lewis was actually born in uh, Weymouth, Massachusetts. And uh, he, uh, he finished his PhD at Harvard in 1899, and then like so many Americans of the day, went off to Europe. And he post in Europe for a while, and then he came back and got a job at MIT. And he taught at MIT from 1905 to 1912. And then in 1912, he was lured to the West Coast, where they were starting a, to establish the chemistry department at the University of California, Berkeley. And he went out to Berkeley, and that's where he spent the rest of his career. And uh, we can speculate why he went. Maybe he was fed up with the, with the weather here. Actually, today is one of those few days. Write it down, because one of the few lovely days in Massachusetts. Um, so Gian Lewis, uh, what did he say? He said, well, I've got an idea here. He said, what if, what if hydrogen achieved um, shell filling, not by electron transfer, but by electron sharing? So he posited, he posited the idea uh, of shell filling, shell filling by electron sharing. This is in contrast to electron transfer. So let's see. Oh, there's, a, there's an image of G.N. Lewis. Uh, he died, actually, on the job. He came back to his lab one day after lunch and hit the floor. Uh, so he worked right to the very end. Uh, this is, yeah. Now, here's, a, here's a, um, here are some data taken from a lab uh, notebook and memo, actually, 1902. 1902. And what do you see here? Well, he's got, he's, he's, he developed a notation for us, and we still use this notation to this day, Lewis notation. So here's lithium, and he's got one electron. But we know lithium has three electrons, but only one valence electron. And then there's beryllium and magnesium, two electrons, aluminum with three. Uh, here's fluorine, chlorine. And when they ionize, he puts the eighth electron right here. 
And look at this one for silicon. He's got probably some kernel inside the atom thus. So he's even starting to think about concentric shells. This is 1902. Remember, the Bohr model isn't until 1913. So you can see people struggling. And notice that we have eight electrons in a shell. That's where we're getting the octet stability. And he's using cubes. Now, we know that the cube isn't the shape of the shell, but it's a pretty good device to help you keep track of electron number because there's eight corners in a cube. So it's another example of how that's not what it is, but it's a really good model, and it keeps you out of trouble and allows you to go forward. So this is going back way, way back for uh, G.N. Lewis. So now let's, let's use this idea and, and account for the formation of H2. So here's hydrogen, and using the Lewis notation, we'll put a dot here for its one electron, and we'll bring in a second hydrogen, and we'll use a, a cross here, or an X, to indicate the electron from the second hydrogen. And now we're going to double count. We double count. In other words, double attribute. These are shared electrons, so we, they, they count for both atoms. Double count the shared electrons. And when you do so, what, what, what do you come up with? Well, the element on the left has two electrons, and, the element, and therefore is isoelectronic with helium. Okay? Maybe it was a California thing. There was sharing, and then it was sort of another California concept, like, so it was like helium. And then on this side, on this side, this also sharing, and it's kind of like helium. And so now we have, we've achieved the stability of the filled shell by sharing the electrons. Okay, and I think there's an, I even have another slide of how this is the, this is the more modern version of it, electron dot. So the nucleus and the inner electrons are contained inside the chemical symbol. And actually, this goes all the way to modern quantum mechanics. Density functional theory does the same thing. Lumps all of the inner shell electrons plus the nucleus into one piece, and then the valence electrons are outside. And so, you know, starting in 1902 with some little, little dots and crosses, we go all the way to DFT today. All right. So let's, let's do another one. How about nitrogen? Let's try nitrogen. So... We go to nitrogen, we know the valence electrons, 2s2, 2p3. 2s2, 2p3, so I'll put nitrogen here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now these three electrons here are according to the Hund rule. So it's px, py, pz, and this is the 2s2 sitting over here. And I'll bring in a second nitrogen, and there's its uh, 2s2, 2px, 2py, 2pz. And now what do I have? Look at the nitrogen on the left, 2, 4, 6, 8. So the nitrogen on the left feels as though it has access to 8 electrons. The nitrogen on the right, 2, 4, 6, 8. It feels as though it has access to uh, 8 electrons. So both nitrogens are isoelectronic with neon if we push on this concept of electron sharing. And there's a second thing I want to do is to draw attention to two types of, of orbitals. So these three orbitals in the center consist of electrons that are shared. So these are going to be called bonding orbitals. Bonding orbitals, and bonding and blue both begin with a B. So I'm going to denote the bonding orbitals, or bonding domains, bonding domains, as distinct from the non-bonding domains. In red, red are non-bonding domains. Always two electrons per orbital. They like to live in pairs. That's the way it works. Okay? And so each one of these pairs is a bond. So I can then write nitrogen with three lines through it indicating I have a triple bond. Three pairs of electrons, three bonding domains, triple bond. This is all in formation according to the concept of electron sharing, and Lewis coined a name for the type of bond that is uh, formed in this way. He said we get bond formation. Bond formation involves, bond formation involves cooperative use. Sharing, cooperative. Cooperative use, 
Cooperative use of valence electrons. Cooperative use of valence electrons. So now we can take the co symbol here and the valence here and come up with the term covalent bond. Covalent bond. Covalent bond, thanks to G. N. Lewis. So again, to make sure we're very clear, ionic bond results from electron transfer, covalent bond results from electron sharing. Now we can do this, so let's go to heteronuclear molecules. These are homonuclear, so let's go to heteronuclear molecules. And so, let's see, I've got, I've got some rules up here, I think. Yeah, drawing Lewis structure. So let's go to a heteronuclear molecule. I'm going to choose as an example uh, sulfuryl chloride. Sulfuryl chloride. And I don't expect you to be able to name these things on site. I will always give you the name. I'll say sulfuryl chloride, parenthesis, SO2, Cl2, blah, blah, blah. So, sulfuryl chloride, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up the Lewis structure of sulfuryl chloride. So, center the element with the lowest average valence electron energy. So, um, it turns out that the average valence electron energy stack like this, sulfur is the um, is, uh, lowest, then chlorine, and then oxygen. This is the ranking of average valence electron energies, and you'd be given those, those data. So, it says put sulfur in the center. So that's I'll put sulfur in the center. And then, what does it say? Uh, we're going to count all the valence electrons. So um, sulfur over here is uh, 3s2, uh, 3p4. 3s2, 3p4. So that gives me six valence electrons. And there's two oxygens. And oxygen lies above sulfur. So that's 2s2, 2p4. So that's 2 times 6. So that's 12. All right. Let's put the 6 over here. And then there's two chlorines in this compound. So that's 3s2, 3p5. So that's 5 plus 2 is 7. 2 times 7 is 14. And we add this whole thing up. We get there's 32 valence electrons. And draw a single bond from each surrounding atom to the central atom. All right. So. So again, this is a model. I'm not saying that this is the shape of the molecule, but it's a way to count. All I'm doing is trying to keep track of bonds and paired electrons. So I can put uh, chlorine on either side, and I'll put an oxygen below and an oxygen and an oxygen above. All right. And so I, that's already two, four, six, eight. So I'm losing. I'm losing. Uh, I'm losing 8, so 32 minus 8 is 24. And so with the 24, that means I've got 12 pairs of electrons to, uh, to place. So let's start putting the Lewis structures up. So chlorine consists of um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I'll do the same thing on the other side, 2, 4, 6, 7. And oxygen has 6, so that's 2. 4, 6, and then the lower one, same thing, 2, 4, 6. And sulfur has 6. I'm going to use X's for sulfur. So I'll put 1X with the chlorine, another X with the chlorine, 2 with the oxygen, 2 with the oxygen. And so now we're in pretty good shape, right? Let's, we can identify bonding and non-bonding domains. Here's the bonding. 1, 2, 3, 4. And then the non-bonding. Looks like there's 12, and sure enough, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The 12 non-bonding domains, four bonds, and we have the Lewis structure for this particular compound. And one last little uh, piece worth pointing out. Notice that in the bonds to the chlorine, you have two electrons, as you need. One electron comes from the chlorine, and one electron comes from the sulfur. But in the bonds between the sulfur and the oxygen, the sulfur is so desperate, so desperate to form a bond, that it actually donates both electrons to the bond. And oxygen's happy because it's isoelectronic with neon, and sulfur is happy because it's going to be isoelectronic with argon, but some, you know, it has to go to some length. So this is called a dative bond, a dative bond when both electrons come from the one element. 
Okay, well, this is, this is great. I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do one more. How about, how about uh, methane? How about methane, CH4? So I'm going to start with carbon. Carbon is going to go with the center. And carbon is 2S2, um, 2P2. 2S2, 2P2. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the box notation now. See, I'm, you know, this is a Lewis structure. You know, we, this is a chemical equation. Now we're going to a box structure. We can move fluidly from one model to another. We had cubes up there. It's all good. So this is 2S, and now this is 2, 2P, 2PX, 2PY, and 2PZ. Now, according to this, 2S2, that gives me uh, an electron pair, and then I've got 2P2, which, according to the Hund rule, goes in like this. Well, I've got a problem here. How many unpaired electrons? Two. Now, what's my maximum number of bonds I can form by electron sharing? It's two, according to this. So best I can do, best possible here, is CH2. And that's no good. We know, we know from mass measurements it's CH4, the stoichiometry is CH4. And besides, it, it, what are these orbitals going to look like? These are the p orbitals. These are the p orbitals, so they're dumbbell shaped, and they're orthogonal, right? They're 90 degrees, which means if I, if I formed this thing, which is called methylene, if I formed methylene, uh, I'd end up with CH, CH2 looking like this, which has a dipole moment. And we know from spectral measurements and electrical properties measurements that this thing is symmetric. So this thing, the, the electron sharing isn't working. It's not working. So we need, another, we need another patch here. And that patch comes from none other than Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling, another American. You see, it's American science today, and it's in the 20s. That's why we have Gershwin playing at the beginning, celebration of American science. So Pauling was born in Portland, Oregon. He was the son of a pharmacist, and he went to Caltech, got his PhD in 1925. So the Rhapsody in Blue came out in 1924 when he was just hunkering down to his thesis, probably listened to it, got some pleasure out of it, as most people did. Uh, so then he finishes 1925 at Caltech, in Pasadena, and he goes to Europe. I mean, he chose wisely. He chose four postdoctoral positions. These are the people he postdoc with. First with Sommerfeld, then with Bohr, then with Schrodinger, and then finally with Bragg. You'll learn about Bragg. Bragg got the Nobel Prize for X-ray diffraction. So that's not a bad preparatory start. So he comes back and teaches at Caltech. In fact, I have a picture of Linus Pauling. Uh, there he is. That's a Middle-aged Linus Pauling, uh, probably around the time he got the first of two Nobel Prizes. Um, so what did Pauling do? Pauling said, uh, why don't we mix the orbitals? They're all in the shell n equals 2, and what we're trying to do is to fill the n equals 2 shell. So how about mix? Let's mix 2s and 2p states. Let's mix the 2s and 2p states in order to maximize the number of bonds. Remember, when you form a bond, you decrease the energy of the system. Four bonds is a greater decrease in energy than two bonds. So the system, if it could, and this is, they're all within the same shell. You notice he didn't say, gee, if you mixing 2s with 2p is good, let's go get some 1s. Well, 1s is down in n equals 1, and there's no, no way you can mix. They had to be in the same shell. Mix states uh, in order to maximize to maximize, in order to maximize number of bonds that can form. It's all about maximize, number of bonds that can be formed. And we, this, of course, is by electron sharing. We're talking about covalent bonds here. Okay? And he termed this, he termed these mixed orbitals hybrids term these orbitals, the mixed orbitals, as hybrid orbitals. They're cross-breed, cross part S, part P. So now, let's look at the energy level diagram, or the box notation, forgive me. So I'm going to mix S and P. So I've got a single S, and I've got three P's, so this is called 
sp3. Each one of these is a mixed sp3 hybrid orbital. And I got four of them. And how many electrons do I have? Four. So now I use the Hund rule, and in go the electrons. One, two, three, four. And now I have the ability to form four bonds. But it gets better. Here's the next thing. These are degenerate. They're all in the same state. That's why we're using the Hund rule. And so degeneracy in energy implies degeneracy in spatial orientation. So what does that mean? It means that if these are four bonds equivalent, then the way those bonds will arrange themselves in space is to be equivalent. So if I've got a central carbon here, and I'm going to put four sticks from the central carbon so as to make the four sticks symmetrically disposed in space, that dictates the architecture of the molecule. And how do I put four sticks off of a central point symmetrically disposed in space? One, two, three, and four. This is meant to be the corners of a tetrahedron. Each one of these is 109 degrees apart, and this describes a tetrahedron. So now I've got carbon in the center, and now I've got the hydrogens at the four corners of a tetrahedron. There is the structure of methane. And each of the hydrogens has a shared electron with the carbon, making it isoelectronic with helium, and the carbon has four of its own electrons, four shared with the four hydrogens to make it isoelectronic with neon. So everybody's happy, shell filling, and it's all good. And so now it's symmetric, and it has no net dipole moment. Everything squares with the data. Well, good for, good for Pauling. But he went further. He went much further. What Pauling wanted to do was to, to make it quantitative. And so he wanted to have something analogous in covalent bonding to what we have in ionic bonding. So you know, what Leslie's now rubbing off the board there is, no, keep going. It's, it's OK. It's, this is a rule of academics. You always erase that which you will refer back to. We, we need more boards in here. We need, how many boards do I fill in a period? 9, 18, maybe what? We need about 24 boards. That's a good lecture. All right, so, so here's, what, here's what Pauling was thinking about. He was thinking about the analogy. For example, if I want to get the energy of magnesium oxide, I can use, I can use the, the formula that Leslie has just erased, and it looks like this. So I, if all I need to know is the radius of the anion, the radius of the cation, its charge, and the Madelung constant, and then I just plug in, I get the crystallization energy. But then suppose, instead of magnesium oxide, I want to go to magnesium chloride. I can use the same formula, only I need the Madelung constant. This is the Madelung constant for magnesium oxide. If I have the Madelung constant, forgive me, script M, the Madelung constant for magnesium chloride, and I know the ionic radius of magnesium cation and chloride anion, away I go again. I need this, I need, of course, the Born exponent. This, Born exponent, and away we go. The same formula applies. So I can build with a library of basic physical data. So what did Pauling do? Pauling said, I wonder if we can do the same thing for covalent bonds. Is there some kind of an analogy? So he said, let's take a look at uh, uh, an arbitrary heteronuclear compound. So I'm going to do this with HF, hydrogen fluoride. So first of all, let's build hydrogen fluoride molecule, H with its one electron, and fluorine with its seven. So now, hydrogen sharing an electron with fluorine is isoelectronic with helium. It's happy, and fluorine sharing the electron with hydrogen is isoelectronic with neon. It's happy. So again, we see octet filling, uh, shell filling, forgive me, shell filling by electron sharing. So, the, so what, what Pauling wanted to ask is, how, can, I, can I get a measure of the HF bond energy? HF bond energy, knowing only the bond energies of HH and FF. So then if I knew all the homonuclear bond energies and then I mixed these to make heteronuclear bonds, is there a path from homonuclear bond energy to heteronuclear bond energy? So let's look. Let's look and see what the numbers are. Um, 
it, so hydrogen, the hydrogen bond's fairly strong. It's 435 kilojoules per mole. That's mole of bonds. 435. Fluorine, fluorine is 160. And so, you know, what do you think the value of the HF bond should be? Well, when I first look at this, I say, well, it's part H and it's part F, so it's somewhere between 435 and 160. I don't know if it's the arithmetic mean, you know, add these two and divide by two, or maybe it's a geometric mean, multiply them together and take the square root, but it's got to be somewhere in between. What do the data show? The number is 569. 569, which is greater than 435. So I take a bond of 435 and a bond of 160, I put them together, I get 569. That's very, very strange. But Pauling was smart. Pauling said, I have an explanation. He says, suppose, suppose when these electrons, suppose when these electrons are shared in between the two atoms, Suppose they're not shared equally. Suppose there is a displacement of the electrons. So instead of putting them dead center, as I've been doing up until now, suppose the electrons are actually drawn closer to the fluorine. So we still have octet stability, or in this case, duet stability, but the sharing of the electrons is not equal. So this is charge displacement charge displacement. And what does charge displacement constitute? Well, charge displacement means stored energy. Stored energy. And Pauling quantified that stored energy. He quantified the stored energy. And so what, what he did is he said that you increase the bond strength by thinking of it as a two-step reaction. So in the heteronuclear bond, that is a bond between two different atoms, so in a heteronuclear bond, we form by what, and this is my, this is my coinage. You don't see this anywhere in a book. This is my coinage. Two steps, share and then pull. Share and then pull. So share is, as the name applies, we share electrons to achieve octet stability. But then because we have unequal atoms, we pull towards one of the um, atoms. And which one do we pull towards? Well, we pull towards the one that's got a greater appetite for electrons. And we've already gone through this concept. Which atoms on the periodic table have the highest appetite for electrons? The nonmetals. The weakest appetite is the metals. The metals are good donors. The nonmetals are good acceptors. And fluorine's up in the top right corner. So fluorine has a very, very high appetite for electrons. And indeed, in this bond, the electrons are pulled to the right. And why Pauling got the Nobel Prize and Lewis didn't, it's my theory, is that Pauling was quantitative. So he came up with a quantitative measure. He devised, he devised a quantitative measure, quantitative measure for the degree of unequal sharing, the degree of unequal sharing. thereby allowing us to make these calculations with some accuracy. And he called that quantity electronegativity. Electronegativity. And it's denoted by the Greek symbol chi. By the Greek symbol chi. Okay. And he devised the whole scale. How did he get the scale? He looked at bond energies for all sorts of pairs of elements across the periodic table and went through an exercise with pencil and paper that today we would call uh, multivariable regression analysis and came with a set of, um, oh, this was, I'll, I'll come back to this. This is the structure of methane. This is the S and P. Well, let's take a break. You can stack. All right, so this is what methane looks like. There's the S, there's the P, and the SP hybrid looks like this. It's sort of an asymmetric dumbbell, and these four things stick out, and then you bond the hydrogens, and there's the methane. Okay. So here's, here's what the electronegativity scale looks like. It looks a lot like the scale for average valence electron energies. The nonmetals have the highest appetite for electrons. P 
period, which means in a bond, they're going to hog the electrons. And the nonmetals have the weakest appetite, and so they're going to end up having the electrons in a uh, covalent bond pulled away from them. So nonmetals have high uh, electronegativity, metals have low electronegativity. And now here's taken from uh, the text, and you see that the electronegativity is periodic. If you go across a period, the metal has the lowest value and the nonmetal has the highest, and there's fluorine, number nine, at a value of about four. It's got the most intense appetite for uh, electrons. And then you jump down here to sodium, et cetera, et cetera. Here we are going across to lanthanides and, and whatnot. And this is taken from your text. There's fluorine, 3.984. That's the thing. And down here we have very low values of electronegativity. So with electronegativity, we are now able to make calculations. We're able to make calculations. And this is the Pauling formula for calculating the bond energy in a heteronuclear bond starting from homonuclear bond energy. So let's continue with, with the HF. So if I want to get the bond energy of HF, I'm going to take, and this is the Pauling formula, the geometric mean. So I take the bond energy of hydrogen, hydrogen, times the bond energy of fluorine, fluorine, and square root. So that's the geometric mean of the two. And then comes the Pauling uh, piece that gets from the Nobel Prize. You take the difference in the electronegativity between the two elements squared, and then the factor 96.3 gives us the unit consistency with kilojoules per mole. So the greater the difference in electronegativity, the greater the contribution here in terms of the deviation from just the geometric mean of the two homonuclear bond energies. Or put another way, if you have a homonuclear atom such as H2, it's chi H time minus chi H is zero, so this second term goes to zero. And obviously when fluorine is one of the members, you're going to get a very, very high number because this has the most... And it doesn't matter which order you put them in because you're taking the square. So it's always going to come out positive. And I, wanna, I want you to appreciate the sense of scale here. So if we go in here, we'll multiply. This is going to be 435 times 160. And I'm going to take the square root of this. And then this is 96.3. Uh, and you look on your periodic table, this is 2.2 for hydrogen. Fluorine is 3.98. And I know th there are different... Uh, tables of electronegativity, I don't care, just whatever you've got on your periodic table. The, the, the one in the book is a little bit different, but it all comes out in a wash. Um, so you multiply all this out, and we find that the first term is 264 kilojoules per mole, and the second term is 344. So this second term is even greater than the first term. So the amount of energy in that electron displacement is substantial. And if you sum the two of these, you get 608, 608. You might say, well, wait a minute. The real number is, the real number is 569. Yeah, but 569, 608 takes you in the right direction and accounts for the contribution of electron displacement. 264 is just plain wrong. So this was, a, this was an important start for, um, for uh, Pauling. And he has labels on these two contributions. This first term, which is just the combination of the homonuclear bond energies, this first term is called purely covalent. It's the purely covalent contribution. Purely covalent contribution, and it's what I've been referring to as the sharing. This is what you get from sharing. Okay. And then the second term here, with the difference in electronegativity, is what you get from what I've been calling the pull, the pull on the electron pair. And Pauling called this the uh, partial ionic character. Partial ionic character. It's not saying that there's electron transfer, but it's a move in that direction. Partial electronic character. So what I've done here is I've, I've decided I'll, I'll make a sort of a panorama of what we've seen up until now. And so I'm going to make something called the electron sharing meter. The electron sharing meter. All right, so if I look at a homonuclear system like hydrogen, so my meter, my meter reads neutral. 
So it's the arrows at 12 o'clock. The, the electrons are shared equally. And then if I go to HF, HF, what do I have? Well, I know that the fluorine is pulling the electrons. And so we can, we can designate that by writing delta minus delta plus. Delta, the physicists uh, use the lowercase Greek delta means little bit of. All right, so delta minus means it's a little bit negative, and we've got charge neutrality, so if the fluorine end is a little bit negative, then the hydrogen end has to be a little bit positive, which means this thing has a net dipole moment. It's a dipole, and the arrow points to the negative end. One way to think about it is I put a little uh, slash there, and that starts to look a little bit like a plus sign. You can f come up with your own way to to remember it. So it's, it's got a little bit of a dipole moment. And people, people depict dipoles usually as ovals, and they'll put a minus end and a plus end. So it's net neutral, but the charge is not uniformly distributed. Okay? So our sharing meter, in this case, is going to show something to the right. We've got electrons that are unequally shared, and that moves over to the right. And, you know, the, the dipoles have have uh, interesting properties. Uh, oh, there's a plot of electronegativity three bar in, in, the, in the bar plot. And, and actually, this is an interesting one. Uh, just parenthetically, you see hydrogen here? Hydrogen's weird. It, it, you know, they, they put it in the periodic table above lithium, but it's not an alkali metal. And you can see it just doesn't belong there. And there's a lot of conversation about putting it maybe somewhere centered above the, 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 the P block elements. Because it certainly doesn't belong next to helium, but uh, it probably doesn't belong above lithium either. Anyway, I thought that was very interesting. I can tell from the, the uh, response of the class, uh, why does he care? All right. <laughs> now, this is real. Now, this, I'm going to use an adverb here. This is really important. All right. So here's HCl, which is a cousin of HF. And you see in the upper frame, it's just a bunch of HCl molecules just bopping around any which way. So the, there's the delta plus and the delta minus. Now, if you take these dipoles and you put them in an electric field, they will align themselves. And the, the positive ends will face the negative plate, and the negative ends will face the positive plate. And there's energy stored when the random orientation goes into an ordered orientation. This is the principle behind a capacitor. A capacitor is nothing more than a whole bunch of aligned dipoles. So if you want to invent a supercapacitor that we can use on a car to extend the range of the automobile so we can reduce our dependence on imported petroleum, you're going to look for molecules that have a honking big dipole moment. That way you get more energy per unit electric field. So, you know, again, simple ideas and tells me how to go and invent. I can go back to my office and go and invent something right now just based on this lecture nine. <laughs> See, you go and invent, and you start the company, you make the billion. You remember good old Professor Sadaway at MIT and established the fellowship for students and so on. All right, but you have to know what a dipole moment is. Got to know what a dipole moment is. Okay, so there's the dipole moment. And then lastly, I'm going to put uh, sodium chloride. So what's sodium chloride look like? Well, it's Na plus and Cl minus. So the electron has transferred completely. So this isn't even sharing at all. So this is really bury the needle. This is not sharing. This is not sharing. In this instance, the sodium doesn't even get visitation rights to the electron. The electron's gone. You know, whereas here, hydrogen gets to see the electron on Saturdays, kind of thing. You know, <laughs> depends how, depends what kind of lawyer, what kind of lawyer fluorine had. That's what it all boils down to. All right, now, what you can do, this, this is the same thing, you know, that I just showed you. But I, see, the, tech, the textbook gives you, as the name implies, dense text. I gave you the sharing meter. The sharing meter is far more uh, expositive. All right, and then finally, the percent ionic character is given by this formula here. So this is 1 minus the exponential. So in the EXP term, this uh, exponential of, what is it, uh, minus 1 quarter times the difference in electronegativities squared. This, is, this notation means 
E, base uh, natural logarithms, minus one quarter, blah, blah, blah. That's what this thing is. So if you plug in, multiply by 100%, you get something that goes from 0 to 100. So obviously, when delta chi is, is 0, you get 0% uh, um, per e to the 0 is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0, and so you have no ionic character. And so if you plug in the numbers for uh, HF, so you, you're going to take uh, this dis difference here, square it, uh, it, it ends up giving you 1.8, which gives you a value of about 56% ionic character. So it's as though the electron is sort of half, half transferred. Uh, but you, you might also look at it from this perspective. If you take 344, because this is the partial ionic character, if you take 344, 344, which is the energy of electron displacement over the total energy in the calculation, that turns out to be 57%. So this stuff makes sense. There's a, there's a sensible metric here at work. And so this is what Li uh, Linus Pauling got his Nobel Prize for, and it's the description of polar covalency. Polar covalency. And polar covalency is operative when you have heteronuclear bonds, because the two different elements don't share the electron equally. And the Pauling formula allows you to calculate that. And his, his uh, formative book was written in 1937 called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. OK. So turning to the last five minutes, I want to bring to your attention some uh, covalent molecules. Today we're going to talk about Freon. Freon was a, an invention. It was a designer chemical. Uh, invented by Thomas Midgley. I'm, this is me. I, I named him SP3. That's his nickname. Thomas SP3 for the hybridized orbital. So he was working at the Dayton Engineering Laboratories in Dayton, which was owned by General Motors. And he was working in the 20s at a time when there were no refrigerators in American kitchens. The only refrigerants that were used were either toxic or flammable, things like ammonia, methyl chloride, sulfur dioxide. And you read about horrible accidents, people uh, making ice cream at some plant and the com compressor blows up and two or three people are killed. So it was deemed unsafe in the American kitchen. In the 20s, Midgley discovered this molecule, which looks just like methane, only we've replaced the hydrogens with two chlorines and two fluorines. So this is called dichlorodifluoromethane, and it's a chlorofluorocarbon, a CFC. And this was fantastic stuff. It was colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic. It was not just used as a refrigerant. It was used in propellant. When I was your age, all of the um, sprays, whether it was hairspray, shaving cream, any aerosol was propelled by Freon 12. It was fantastic stuff. Well. It turns out that in the upper atmosphere, you know, you're, pss, 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 you've got people all over the world doing this, eventually this stuff starts floating away. And what turns out in the upper atmosphere, where we don't have shielding from ultraviolet, you know how to do this calculation, because you can look up the, the energy, and in fact, it's part of your homework, where you look at the energy differences and the electronegativity differences, you can compute the wavelength of light that's capable of breaking the carbon-chlorine bond and it turns out to be in the ultraviolet. Once the chlorine is broken, you have a chlorine radical, and that chlorine radical goes over here and attacks ozone. Cell phone, out. Just get up and leave, out of courtesy. Hello? Hello? The first year I was teaching 3091, there was a Nobel Prize awarded to Mario Molina, who was a faculty member here in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences, who had worked uh, years earlier at University of California, Irvine, and had speculated on the mechanism by which uh, ozone depletion occurs and, and linked it to rising levels of CFCs. Initially, 
Uh, that's why it says a vindication. Initially, people poo-pooed it, said it was crazy. There isn't enough of this pss -pss to cause any trouble. But then later with the NASA program, they started taking a lot of images, and they could track ozone levels in the atmosphere and start seeing that not only was ozone changing, but there were actually pockets where ozone was being uh, depleted at an accelerating rate because obviously the atmosphere isn't constant composition and constant temperature. Duh. So anyways, yeah, there he is. And uh, this was the paper that was published in 1974 in Nature. And uh, uh, this was done before computers. The PC wasn't uh, 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 invented and, and um, commercialized until the early 80s. So this was typeset. And the person who typeset it obviously didn't take 3091 because instead of atom hyphen catalyzed, we have atom catalyzed. Um, but even <laughs> ignoring the. Even ignoring the spelling error in a Nobel Prize winning paper, uh, <laughs> the Nobel Committee overlooked this. Yeah, yeah. So th there it is. And uh, then they went to HFCs and so on. There's a, there's a lot of um, activity in, in this. And what happened is when we changed from CFCs to HFCs, we had to change the design of the compressors. And what happened was everything got much, much more efficient. So this was an example of necessity for a change that was driven by concern for the environment, instead of putting people out of work and killing an industry, gave us much more efficient refrigeration. And the last thing I'll show you is this, to draw your attention. This was in your textbook. This is the cap at the top of the Washington Monument. The Washington Monument was built to celebrate the American centennial, 1876. They finished it in 1884. And this is 100 ounces of aluminum, because aluminum was a precious metal. It was priced higher than silver. 1884. Two years later, Charles Martin Hall and Paul E. Rule invent an electrochemical process that drives the price of aluminum down to the point that we make beer cans, I mean soda cans, out of it today. <laughs> and a good example of how chemical innovation can lead to superior products. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>